Hi, I'm speaking to you from Nam, Melbourne, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and to the ancestors of the lands where you come from. Today, now with your permission, we will share our learnings over the course of the next hour. Hosted on the Garland platform, the Reinventing the Wheel series is an initiative of the Knowledge House for Craft, an association of thinkers and makers that aims to reflect the global diversity of our field. Each of these talks becomes a spoke in the wheel, a growing repository of craft knowledge. Now, inspired by the discourse of our Tongan colleagues, we call on the previous speaker to make a link in the chain and offer a salutation before we begin. And it's my great pleasure to uh, hand over to Shivani Gandhi, who helped deliver the MAP Academy talk in the previous session. Thank you, Shivani. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I would like to recite a poem by Kabir, a 15th century poet, mystic poet. Um, so here it goes. Um, I weave your name on the loom of my mind to make my garment when you come to me. My loom has 10,000 threads to make my garment when you come to me. The sun and moon watch while I weave your name. The sun and moon hear while I count your name. These are the wages I get by day and night to deposit in the lotus bank of my heart. I weave your name on the loom of my mind to clean and soften 10,000 threads and to comb the twists and knots of my thoughts. Nor, no more shall I weave a garment of pain. For you have come to me, drawn by my weaving, ceaselessly your name on the loom of my mind, by Kabir. Thank you. That's, that's very beautiful. And uh, thank you for introducing us to the, to the thinking in the poetry and the world of Kabir, which plays such a big role in, in, in craft generally, as well as in India as well. So now it's my great pleasure to hand over to our speaker. Uh, that's Christina Zetterland. And just a few words about uh, Christina. Um, Christina introduces a, a Nordic voice into our conversation. Scandinavian countries have broken new ground in including the voice of making in the academy. At the same time, there's been a, a fresh dialogue between the two worlds of craft, the folk culture of Hemsloid and the urban craft of Kunsthandwerk. Christina Zettelin has taken a, a leading role in democratizing craft. In the southern region of Smarland, she curated an exhibition of Friggers, the one-off work, one works made by factory glassblowers. And recently, the Blue Leo Biennial of Art and Craft that she curated brought folk arts, particularly Sami Dwoji, into the museum and gallery. And she's also Associate Professor at the Design and Change Program at Linnaeus University and curator of the Relearning the Archive Project. Today, she'll share with us one of her passions, the art and life of the Roma jeweler Rosa Tycon. This touches on tensions in Swedish society, particularly over ethnic minorities, but it offers also an inspiring story of agency and the capacity of an individual to harness her craft skills to make an impact in the world, both for herself and for her people. Over to you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you so much for the salutation. That was such a great start for, for this talk and opening it up our, our ways of thinking and, you know, where craft can take place, because I think that that is also very much introduces and, and gives a way to, to Rosa, because I think that she also in, in many ways... Uh, gives a broad perspective on what craftism can do. I, I will share my screen. Um, and, and it is, as Kevin says, this is one of my great passions. And here you see an image of her with her jewelry. 
and it was a passion that started here when I um, when I was working at Konstak, which is the the largest art and applied art school in in, in Sweden. And I was professor there for five years. And when I started as a professor there, uh, I invited Rosa to come and talk uh, about her her work. And why I did that was that because she was herself a student at the school in the beginning of the 1960s. Um, and she was uh, uh, she started uh, in the 1961 at Konstfak. And she was at that time 35 years old. So, so, uh, and I will come back to the reasons why why she was a little bit older when, when she started. But I I want to you see here um, Rosa sitting in this her studio, at Konstfak, but also a little bit uh, of her work from her bench. It when when she started at Konstfak, she she it it was a. It was a period of change uh, when it comes to jewelry, where jewelry it was expanded, uh, questioned, uh, and you can see some of that work here through two quite prominent uh, jewelry artists, that is Sigurd Persson and Viviana Thorin Bill of Hybe, and that uh, you know jewelry was not just mere decoration, but became something that you know sort of an expression and an adornment uh, in in a sort of extended way. And this is this is a, I think is is one is an important background when when talking about Rosa because you can see this kind of um expressionist sort of uh, aspect into Rosa's jewelry. And I would say that she was part of renewing this this sort of modernist expressive jewelry tradition. But what she also did uh, was that she came from uh, another tradition as well. And uh, she comes from a um, Calderas Roma background. And Calderas Roma is a, uh, was a group of Roma that, that came to Sweden in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, and her, within her family, there was a lot of uh, silversmiths. Her father was a silversmith that was uh, educated in, according to the oral uh, oral narration in some account. Uh, and you can see the one uh, down to the, the with the belt uh, is, is, um, is, is made by him. And here you can see the traditional that that the the filigree, you know, that turned uh, um, thread, uh, but also this kind of that you, which is also very traditional in the Roma, that you would have these kind of coins that could uh, be used, uh, you know, when, when needed. So it was also sort of a, a banking system. And and what is is funny with these ones, you can see that it is a dog, and it says the Swedish uh, dog union. So it was commemorative coins for the the, um, and then you see that uh, the big, what you could call sort of necklace if you want, or you know breast adornment, which was a sort of a ceremonial uh, necklace. And the, here you also see the filigree, but also the uh, the small granuli, I think is called in English, the small. Um, uh, the sm the small the small decorations, and I just mentioned these two because they they are important uh, aspects that that Rosa picks up in her own jewelry, because what she does uh, and here you see, you see a little bit closer of that that uh, main um, and you can see the 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 round ones here with the with the, both with the filigree and the the small granule. Um I just want to point them out uh, and also how is she, you know, how the, the surfaces are decorated. I just want to bring them out because you will recognize it when I'm I'm coming to Rosa, that that how she works with, the, um, you know, incorporating and developing this tradition. So I would say that, um, and here is a, is an early work by Rosa uh, from when the period when she was at, at the school. And here you can see how she she uh, she sort of gets inspired and works with that uh, specific Roma tradition, uh, 
but also that she she brings out uh, you know this kind of modernist jewelry tradition and i think that this is this is makes her quite remarkable because she renews not just one tradition but two through her work and i will also come back to that in my presentation um and here you see her degree work, um, which is also that kind of construction of the belt, but also the uh, that you saw with her father's uh, um, in her father's uh, jewelry, and and then how how she uses these kind of techniques. And here you see an image of her sister, because the belt was for her sister, and it's quite important here to mention her sister, because they. Um, in the 1960s, when Rosa was at the at, at Konstfak, she was very much also engaged in in a civil rights movement to claim the civil rights for the Roma, and her sister was a, a you know a very prominent uh, uh, figure in this movement, uh, as well as Rosa. And um, Katarina wrote a book uh, that was called The Roma Lady. Uh, and it was published in 1963. Uh, and this book, where she gives an account of her own story, but also her family story, which was one of the first um, sort of personal accounts, and that got a lot of attention. Uh, they started also um, a Roma organization that may, uh, made a publication giving voice to to you know this struggle from a Roma perspective. It was a struggle for getting rights to go to school. It was a struggle. And here you can see uh, um, Katarina uh, meeting when, when uh, Martin Luther King came to to uh, Stockholm to re receive his Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, that was arranged a meeting between them. And I just have this image here just to, you know, to under you know, just to to uh, communicate, you know, the, the kind of importance of her that it was you know that that it was quite a a, a wide and wide-ranging struggle that they that they were involved in and 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 here is is you know and this is images that are you know from late 1950s early 1960s so still in that day and age um roma people were living in 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 um in this kind of uh you know temporary housing uh, so the struggle was about education, but it was also to 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 get housing, and the 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 um, the text that you see here, the 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 book that you see here, is a, a book from nineteen twenty three, and the title says uh, "A Law Against Vagrants," and it is uh, in Sweden that was it was illegal since the late nineteenth century to 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 be an in, an itinerant person. Uh, and that was, you know, constantly sort of updating that law, uh, you know, how to control itinerant people. And this is uh, the the 1923 version, uh, sort of research for 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 updating the law against itinerant people. And in this uh, version of it, it's not just that they they it's not just writing about. Uh, uh, itinerant people in general, but they also um, mapped, and it's like a whole chapter uh, around Roma people. Uh, and they, they also mapped Romas, you know, they, 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 they got through the police, the municipality to map Roma all through Sweden. And, and in this one, it stated that Roma people, uh, I mean, they are Swedish subjects, so we cannot throw them out, but we want to make their life as difficult as possible so they want to voluntarily leave. And one way to do that was not to allow them to settle, you know, with these kind of caravans, that, you know, if they would come and, and put the, the caravans up, you know, it could be a couple of days, but maximum three weeks, and then they had to leave and go to some other place. So it was a it was a lot of tension, and of course that that you couldn't stay in one place also meant that you couldn't get an education. You know, the kids couldn't go to school if the school would allow the Roma kids to enter. I mean, there's a numerous um, 
you know, institutional racism against Roma that 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 they were fighting against. So while she was at Kunstwerk, she was also very much engaged in in this uh, civil rights movement. And uh, when she when she uh, left school, uh, she she um, uh, she was offered a, um, a solo exhibition at the National Museum in in, um, in Stockholm. Uh, and here you can see uh, the poster for it with a, with a picture of her uh, and then a, a, an image of the exhibition. And what is interesting with this exhibition is that she she didn't just make it as an exhibition about herself and her own jewelry. She used this exhibition as a platform for that struggle. And I will just show you, uh, and this is in Swedish, but I will I will uh, go through what, what it says. And this is the plan uh, for the exhibition. And here you can see an image uh, from the exhibition. So what she did was that you, uh, can you see my arrow? Yeah. And yes, and and what 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 she did was that you know you can see here uh, I will just move <laughs> the images of that in this one uh, she has uh, her own jewelry Rosa Taiko she had here was trad smicken which means traditional jewelry so she also collected jewelry from from her own family to show and here she had also jewelry by Bant Janusz that then was her husband. So it was both about her and her close collaboration with her husband, but also showing traditional jewelry uh, from her family, you know, and, you know, from where she had learned uh, those traditions. But equally important was also that, that they used the exhibition to tell about the history and the contemporary struggles. So here, they had what is called hist which means historical maps. So it was maps of 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 the history of Roma, you know, uh, the, the the you know, both globally but also within Sweden. Here they would talk, about, but it was also uh, nice images, you know, from Roma uh, families within Sweden. So it was really to inform a public about Roma context, about, uh, and here was about the social background, uh, which was also then about this kind of struggles uh, that, that was going on. And then it was called Arbetsbilder, which means images of work, which was images of Rosa making her jewelry. So you can see that it was, a, uh, it was not just about her jewelry, but her jewelry then became a platform uh, for, for arguing for for the the you know for for uh, ro you know this kind of civil rights movement in in a, in a larger context uh -huh, why doesn't it change and here you can see a lovely image <laughs> from the opening and here you see some of the traditional jewelry this is a necklace that her father did and this is one of those kind of uh, also uh uh, traditional uh, sticks uh, that you you have sort of a ceremonial sticks that you have within the Calderas Roma, and here's one of uh, a series of those kind of traditional buttons that you would also find find in the uh, in in um, in Roma traditions. But what they also did was this uh, at the same time as as the exhibition was was taking place was that there was a large group of uh, Roma uh, from uh, mainly from France that came to, that was in Stockholm, but they were going to be detained. Uh, so then the exhibition also became a platform for uh, arguing uh, for the Roma group to, to stay. So what you see here is a demonstration and it says on the placards, it says, please uh, let us stay. And you can see here, this is this is uh, the poster from the exhibition. So here it says about the sort of information about the exhibition. Uh, but it also says, uh, it, the, the poster also, it also argues for the, 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 the group that they should be allowed to stay. And the, all through, and this is also part uh, uh, um, 
uh, this kind of uh, messages that was part of the the um, the social background and and it talks about its messages that are talking about um the the status of the the refugees and uh both how the swedish state formulates it and that they uh, that we cannot have people just coming and 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 staying in sweden but then of course uh as you can see here is also the katarina tycon's answer to this and just just to give you an extra background to this in, in relation to Sweden is also that when the Swedish nation state was forged, uh, uh, there was a period from the late 19th century to 1914 that you didn't have to have a visa to enter or exit Sweden. So, so, but then in 1914, a passport was introduced in Sweden. And when you read the background text for uh, introducing visas in Sweden, was that uh, they wanted to control Roma that was traveling between the Nordic countries. So, so introducing visa was 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 a was it was a reason to to um, uh, you know to control Roma movement. But what that that law also did was that to say that you know also this to make the life difficult for Roma in Sweden was also that you would, uh, Roma was not allowed to enter nor exit, which meant that the Roma that was in Sweden was trapped. You know, they couldn't exit, they couldn't go outside Sweden. Until 1954, so between 1914 and 1954, uh, Roma people wasn't allowed neither to enter nor to exit. So if you left Sweden, you were not allowed to come back. And with a lot of complications in so many. So there is, there is, there is a, there is a quite a, um, uh, you know, um, sort of, I mean, this is sort of a, a continuation of that institution, institutional racism against against Roma people. And then here, they also, there was also this kind of drawings, uh, which is also, uh, and here is the, 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 the politicians. Uh, here's the the prime minister, and here is the head of the migration board. Uh, here, <laughs> and then it also then sort of arguing against this uh, detaining uh, this group of Roma. They were detained, so it didn't work. Uh, but I think it is an interesting. I think that this exhibition is very interesting, and I think it's also very interesting, both in terms of you know. An exhibition, big exhibition as such, and how an exhibition can be be used as a platform for for change and arguing for change, uh, but also how she used her jewelry um, uh, to argue, you know, to as as a platform for this civil rights movement. I don't know what. Oops, uh, but I would also argue that this kind of aspect of change is is. Uh, is in goes in many other directions and i want to because this this kind of struggles is i would say is maybe what you say uh, is is more sort of a traditional activism and this is a jewelry uh, the barai law is 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 a, a jewelry that was in the exhibition that then uh, the national museum would uh, would acquire after the exhibition and I would also say that, you know, it's just staging the Roma exhibition in the National Museum, you know, a museum that neither before nor after has given any interest in Roma. You know, it also, you know, that kind of, you know, that kind of, um, uh, you know, that kind of lack, also, I think, also became quite evident of putting her jewellery there. And this is a... a you know the, the acquisition that they did is the only acquisition that they made of her. You know that's the only the only piece of jewelry. Even though she had a very successful, uh, and you know she was, you know, awarded a lot of, um, you know, prominent <laughs> prizes, and and you know she's represented in many collections. But this is the only jewelry, and this is a jewelry from you know from early in her career in 1969. Which means that, you know, if you look at like someone like Torun Bil of Hybe that I presented before, they have 35 pieces of her. And this fact that she has, you know, Torun Bil of Hybe 
you know, as, as an artist is allowed a development, is allowed to have change. Whereas Rosa becomes, you know, doesn't have time. She doesn't have, you know, that kind of artistic development. And I would also, you know, you know, you you can you can think about why why is that? Why is the Rosa just allowed one? And I would also like to come back to that when I invited Rosa to to come to Konstwerk, you know, in in nineteen and this is when twenty fourteen, that was the first time that she came back to the school after she graduated in nineteen sixty seven, and I think that that also you know says quite a lot. And also this, uh, I would also say that, and if you, if you look at the text that the museum has in relation to the the um, uh, to Rosa's piece, you can it reads Rosa Teichel's work modernized and reinterpret uh, traditional Roma silversmithing. She also advocated for the rights. I mean, just just you know that that is just a Roma tradition that she renews, not that she did as as the you know. Uh, not acknowledging how she renews also the sort of modernist art jewelry tradition. And then it goes on and says that she also advocates for the rights and place of Roma in society, not the least in her book, Sigi Anashka, which she wrote together with her older sister, uh, Katarina Taikon, which is to totally wrong. I mean, that was a book. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's like one of the most important book in Swedish Roma history. But that is a is a book written just by her sister, and 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 I I also think that that is it also shows I think that that also shows why they just there's just one jewelry I think that the interest in in this history is not that great. So I think that that also you know that that uh, so I think that there is another struggle here, is another is uh, uh, another aspect of her work that I think is perhaps equally as important. And it's also the aspect of acknowledging her, not just um, uh, to acknowledging her that she renewed to tradition and that she doesn't become her minority, you know, that she does, she's not an emblem of a minority, but she, she is actually, uh, you know, she, 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 her jewelry works in, 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 in many different ways. And therefore, I just want to show, um, uh, I would just want to show part of that history and also how she, how, how her work developed and how her work, uh, how she, you know, because she, all through her career, she would use, um, she would have those two elements. But it would develop all through her career, and here, here is an early piece of her, and you can see the shape here that looks like an axe. And I don't know if you if you remember it, but from the 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 jewelry of of her, uh, her father, that belt had also that shape, and that is also uh, um, a form and tradition that that you know a, a form that she picks up from the tradition but it's very clearly you know you can also see that kind of expressive jewelry <laughs> that that you know that that kind of modernist jewelry and how that how she she combines those two and here uh, and here's another uh, example of of it and here you can also see you know and it's super precise and super you know super elaborate um, and also how she works with this kind of very nice, you know, you know the 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 sort of clip of it, uh, and also how she she um, you know sort of altered the forms in 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 different ways. And here you can see how she works with the forms in a ring, but you again you you can see the axe form and then the filigree and granuli here. Um, and and how she constantly has this kind of interest in form, and how she used that, uh, and sort of constantly with that kind of uh, a curiosity in in um, in this kind of shapes and forms, uh, and how she constantly changes and and you know works with the time. And here's two other examples of rings, um, and here's again. Um, 
if I just want to come to these ones, because also I think it's also, and here she starts to have um, aspects of gold in it. And you can see, you can see all through her, you know, the development, how she, um, you know, you can see when, when, when in the beginning of the 1980s, when sort of, uh, you know this kind of postmodernism expressionist comes around, and how she how that becomes how that colors her her practice, and and you know this kind of more sort of exclusive materials comes into it, and how that's also changed her the ways that she phrases her work, and I think all of this kind of that she constants sort of questions and develops and thinks about these kind of forms, and but how she returns to that those kind of elements, but but. You know, you know, constant, constantly changes it. I think that that is, is really interesting. And and you know, even though it is those two formats, but the kind of uh, possibilities of them, when you look through her her jewelry, is is, is quite amazing. And my last you know, image is this one, um, which is of her home that she did together with her then husband Ben Jonas, that was an architect. And I will see this as a sort of Alkunstwerk, you know, Gesamtkunstwerk, you know, as, 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 as a piece of art in itself. And you can see here also how these kind of forms, you know, even the chairs has, you can recognize nice the the, the shape of her jewelry or, or you can in the, and this is the garage door. And you can see how, how the, the forms from her art sort of comes, um, uh, also is in the way that they shape uh, their home so so it's it's not it's not you know you know that kind of expression is 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 it's mainly for her and limited to the jewelry but I think it's interesting I think their house is is a is a is a very interesting case because it's you know how it's you know that kind of artist expression also ex expands um, beyond um her jewelry and this is an old school that is in a very small village north of of um, slightly north in the sort of north middle part of sweden and that they they restored and made into this kind of in you know, both workshop but also um, this kind of art piece i think i will stop there and, and thank you for listening to 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 my passion about Rosa Taikon. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. And there are many questions that come out of what you've said. And uh, uh, Shivani and Monica, if you've got particular questions or comments, feel free to suggest. But uh, Monica. I just want to to congratulate you, Christina, for this um, for for this in depth analysis of the work of this amazing woman, and also to thank you for sharing um, such an empathetic and, and also a, a comprehensive um, a mix of her who she was and how her work has also been intimately tied with um, activism and advocacy for for the rights of Roma people. The Roma history is also very tied to to our history in Romania. In, in multiple aspects and um, it's also fantastic to see elements um, in a way this and it's also tied to India right so much because yes. I'm fascinated <laughs> with the topic and I'm um, I, I I was when I went to Rajasthan and I started reading then books uh, that are written about the Roma history and they come from Rajasthan and they have settled in Romania uh, for some reason they liked it here um, but what's amazing about the Roma community in Romania is that in many aspects they are the custodians of also Romanian traditional uh, mm -hmm. knowledge and expressions today. They are the ones that are the only ones that um, ended up keeping it alive in a turmoil time in history for Romanian mm -hmm. people where we had mm -hmm. lost in a way our or had conflictual relationship with our identity and the way we expressed it in textiles and other means whilst the Roma people kept those those uh, both aesthetic and meanings alive and there's many villages in Romania where um, it's so interesting the custodians of of our 
history in a way it, it are the Roma people. And the fact that they are nomadic is uh, something or that, that nature of, of being nomadic is so much embedded in my personal DNA that I don't, um, you know, it's, it's looking back at history and thinking, you know, when laws were made to restrict that that type of exploration of the world and that type of lifestyle, why would you do that? So it's fantastic to connect over this topic, also a topic that was very sensitive to me as a child because um, in because Roma people have been um, uh, very discriminated in our country, but also in the entire EU. So when I was uh, traveling abroad uh, with youth organization that I was part of for a long time, the European Youth Parliament, and because I am uh, slightly well, my grandfather is is not a light colored skin. They would say I'm a gypsy, which to me then was uh, as a 15 year old, I felt very, um, I felt bad really. And I felt I need to step up and say um, two things. It was no, Romanian and Roma are two different uh, um, identities, but at the same time, Roma people are not bad. Um, so why like, or, <laughs> you know not everyone is and and it was just so an interesting a reality to um to grow up in at that age um well which was a complex i think context also in when you think about after uh, it was 2000 and something it wasn't um you know in the mm -hmm. 60s it was like recent um in that sense um yeah so thank you so so much and i just want to share like a little in, in a way of fun Maybe not fun fact, but I've I'm now working with um or exploring in my around my villages um the different Roma communities and the way uh, and their garments, um uh -huh. and uh, the fascination of the garments and especially like the different symbols and how they kind of the these relationships with what means power and wealth and success and how they mm -hmm. really toy with those symbols it's fascinating to see um as a as a new new kind of a, a new well a learner in in the process thank you so much well thank you so much for the very kind words and and i i i mean there is an yeah i mean there is an intimate link of course and i think that and also you know a lot of I mean, also that the enslavement of Roma in, in, in Romania. And I also think that that is also a reason why the, the you know, they started to come a lot of groups in the late 19th century and also why there was quite a lot of Roma groups traveling all through through the Nordic countries. So, uh, you know, there is such an intimate, you know, and also Caldera, you know, Calderash is also Calderat, you know, yeah. is quite prominent in, in, in Romania as well. And, and, and you know, so I, I've been, I've been to Romania quite a lot. And one of the reasons is exactly what you say, you know, this kind of, you know, with an interest in the Roma culture and and, and the kind of how alive it is as well you know, and quite visible in in Romania uh, and sort of and visiting Roma groups and Roma museums and, you know, and, and it's, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that context so it's really nice to hear you talk about it. And as you say, the link to India is also, and you can see it it quite a lot also in in, in Rosa. I mean, in the, in those maps, they they uh, they start those maps in India. Uh, but of course, that is also, I mean, you should take you should you should take these kind of histories because they are very much sort of um oral histories and they constantly change you know what is what and and there is a lot of you know I also think a lot of different views and you know and but but I mean I, I think it's really interesting I mean if you if you list I mean if you you know the the counting in Romanes you know it's check do you can you know which is the the Persian way of counting so you which is also this kind of very sort of transnational uh, transnationalism of Roma which which of course then you know, within the nation states become so threatening. And then that kind of institute, you know, leading up to that kind of institute, institutional racism, which is, um, but yeah. But I think that that is also, I, you know, I and, and I thank you also for acknowledging, you know, also that kind of, you know, the 
that you know the many aspects of it because I also think that that's also why it becomes so important also to acknowledge you know her as an artist you know that kind of how she you know she is such a you know she's such a you know such a complex artist that both with the civil rights movement but also how she works with this kind of you know the interest of beauty when, when I the first time I talked to her when I invited her to come to uh, to Konsvak, the first thing that she told me is that yeah you're destroying jewelry uh, at Konsvak today you don't make proper jewelry anymore <laughs> because it is about you know it's not about that then you know that kind of fine making any longer and I think that that was was quite an interesting aspect to it as well and sort of a complex aspect so thank you so much <laughs> well, I, I, I would wonder, like to hear more about yeah yeah, yeah sorry, I wonder sorry. there given Shivani you're with us perhaps like that film Lacho Drom that, that that looked at Roma culture coming originally from Rajasthan whether you feel there's any sensibility in India today uh, in terms of that legacy that came from India um, to be very honest, I was, um, uh, thank you so much, Christina. Um, I was, um, I wasn't aware of the history from our people in Sweden. So this talk has really opened my eyes and I'm, I'm really excited to just read a lot more about, uh, about their struggle and their history. Um, it, with regards to Rajasthan, currently, uh, not many people, I mean, people know of this, but it's not acknowledged. Um, I, I would say a lot of people are not even aware of this history. Um, I, 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 I sort of knew of the connection, um, through a friend of mine, um, you know, who I studied with at, uh, in America. And then it was through a conversation with her. I, I found out about this history and connection with Rajasthan. But before that, even I was not aware. And, and I think only few people in India know of, of this history and this connection, um, but with regards to her jewelry, uh, and this is just my personal observation, I did feel so much familiarity with yes. the kind of jewelry that yes. I've seen in India, especially from yes. Gujarat and Rajasthan. Um, and that just uh, before before you even mentioned about the connection with India, I could just feel that familiarity um, yeah. in her work. Um, the the other thing I just I was just thinking was you know, a similar like connection to uh, the caste system in India with regards to goldsmith and silversmith. So um, again, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know much about, uh, I, I, I'm, I haven't researched much about this, but you know, the Vishwakarma community uh, here, um, there are different kinds of caste within them. And one is related to blacksmith, one is related to carpenter, uh, uh, stone, and then it comes down to goldsmith and silver, which are, which are the higher, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at the higher uh, level. And there's always a struggle because uh, they, because they deal with gold, silver, uh, which is really precious metal. They always there's a struggle that they want to elevate themselves to the to the highest class of Brahmins, uh, but there's that struggle always there. Um, but it is also very like in terms of caste in India, like it is something which is so unique that a lot of the families here um, will always have like a family jeweler. Um, so like you have a family doctor and then, you know, a doctor that you always go to, but a lot of the families here, and I'm talking about a certain specific, uh, class of the community, uh, but just to give you, give you an example that, um, a lot of families here have a very trusted family jeweler who, with whom they will do, um, all the, uh, jewelry thing. And that person is sometimes so blindly trusted, um, uh, that it's, um, uh, it's a different level of trust, like something that you would have with your, uh, I don't know, with your lawyer or with your accountant or something like that. Wow. Yeah. That is so, interesting. yeah, like my, like my mom, for instance, she has a family jeweler and every time she buys or wants to buy something, like she will be in consultant with him. Um, and, and it's quite funny because it's so normal. Uh, it, I wouldn't say it's normal, but like it's, it's quite, 
okay you know uh, to have a family jeweler here in in certain families but you would never hear that outside and and when somebody mentions that like it it just sounds very different um i just wanted to quickly show um uh, these uh silver anklets they belong uh-huh. to my mom and she just gave it to me and i thought um and i just wanted to show them so they they're from i think from the 80s uh, she bought them before she got married and i think they're from uh if i'm not like they are from rajasthan mm-hmm. um but uh, now there are many representations of these so but just to yeah just to just show you guys um these thank you I... thank you so much yeah thank yeah. you so much but uh yeah thank you so much for this talk um and i'm really uh, going to read a lot more about this um topic this and thank you so much design. good thank you so much for your reflections <laughs> it's been wonderful to to have uh, these resonances uh I just had one other question, Christina, before we wrap up, which was about the conflict, uh, the sense of lack of recognition that you felt that that Rosa had. And I know that in a country like Australia, we were very influenced by the the German school in the development of contemporary jewellery, figures like Hermann Junger, who established the Academy in Munich, uh, was really the dominant uh, model for what an art jeweler was, which was very much an individual, somebody who looked at the world around them uh, through fairly modernist lens in terms of geometry and and form, fairly abstract, and uh, attempted to create something original that came from their character, from their sense of self. And Mm -hmm. in that sense, it was a detachment from cultural tradition. It was a an attempt to break from the kind of social context of of the jeweler, and so not being beholden to the past was a sign of strength, you know, of of bravery in terms of facing uh, the possibility of making one's one's work oneself. And so I wonder whether that was a similar kind of understanding in Sweden. So somebody like Rosa would be seen as compromising because she was still beholden to her tradition uh whether that would have been i would i would i wouldn't say that i wouldn't say that that is part of the reading i i i would i would rather say the opposite because i think that uh one aspect of her i also think i i think that the reason you know why she got that uh, exhibition at the national museum at that time you know in that kind of counter movement you know it 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 was, you know, Roma became, you know, the uh, National Museum was the last one. You know, the the Royal Library had already done a Roma exhibition. The National Theater had already done a, a Roma uh, theater. But what also was at that time, of course, you have that kind of expressive jewelry, which is maybe sort of five years earlier than Rosa. You know, Sigurd Persson and 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 Torun of Hilbe. And and where where it's sort of construct is the important environment. But what also happens around that you know that time is also that kind of within the counter movement there is also a, a, a very big interest for the local the localism, but also about this kind of um, about traditions, you know. So you would see how how uh, this kind of revival of uh, you know traditional knowledge is revivals of uh, and and an interest for. Uh, you know, traditional, whatever that was part of the counter movement, and that that uh, so so I think that that you know in the nineteen sixties I don't think that that was, um, and I and uh, and I think I I don't think that that was what what I don't think that 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 was the reason, and I th- also think that uh, when you read her jewelry, I don't think that necessarily a majority has to references. That she has, I don't think that they they are read necessarily as backward looking, and when you look at them, I mean they they are very comparable, you know, in the way that they, you know, this kind of expressive and the way that she places them and the way she, that she uses the jewelry is very comparable to her peers. So so um, I, I unfortunately uh, that would be a nice route to take, but I don't think that that is the route. 
I, I, I mean, I, and I don't think that that is the reason why Konstvak didn't invite her back until 1914. I think, I think it is because also when you see in the reception of her, you can see it in the around 1960s and 70s that, you know, they, they are interested in her as an artist, whereas the years goes on, she is being more and more essentialized as Roma. And then her life story becomes more important than her jewelry. And I think that that is also, you know, and I think, but, and I think that that is also quite, you know, for a lot of minorities, you know, that you, you, okay, we have the artist and then we have the minority artist and they become an, you know, despite who you are in that minority, you, you get sort of represented by, you know, and I, and I don't think that, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of that, you know, that she renewed dual traditions, but that also disappears later on that then again you know but also you know you can also see it in the in the in the poster it says roma jewelry and then her name so again you know you they are interested in her as that minority rather than her as a you know totem bill of hope the way that they describe her work is you know how she treats form and renews and brings stones in and whatever but but rosa will never get that that kind of um... so I think what you're presenting, Christina, is an important challenge. Really, is is how to have both. You know how to have yes. both that modernist sense of uh, original creation, alongside you know being an active member of one's group of one's people, and that they're not uh, contrary as we might think, or not exclusive, uh, but they can they can reinforce one another. That can be innovation within that tradition uh, that it's important to recognize. So that's a really important contribution. And I want to thank you so much for the time and thank thanks Shivani and Monica for uh, uh, reverberating the, the Roma theme that has come up, which is a very promising and new one. And uh, we'll see how this continues as it begins to reverberate within our knowledge vault in terms of the other presentations. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Nina. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting That's... me. And thank you That's so that. much for your generous comments and sharing. Thank you.